Amen, amen, amen. I am not exaggerating when I say this is going to be the best Bible study of our entire lives. And here's why. As a team of, of teachers, every week we're going to give you questions that are going to be very much tied to. There won't be any trick questions. There'll be four to six questions tied to what we're going to teach the next week. And you get to wrestle through them yourselves. One or two of them will be really easy. Two or three of them will have to dig a little bit. It's going to make the Word of God where we're studying it together rather than just people preaching to you. Luke is a book like no other book. Father, let the Word of God this day fascinate us. But even more so, let it be digested and come alive through us that we might be transformed into the image of your Son. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said... Amen. Three things. First of all, Luke was a Gentile. Hello? What in the world is a non-Jew doing writing a gospel? Are you kidding me? Second, he was an expert doctor and researcher. Why is that important? Well, let's just pause for just a minute. Three of the four gospels are biographies. The gospel of Mark is really called the gospel of Peter because it was just Peter telling his story and Mark was the stenographer. The gospel of Matthew was uh, Mark, took Mark's gospel and added some of Matthew's personal story and obviously John. So Mark, Matthew, and John, each of those gospels, the writing of them, you know, 300, 500 hours. Luke is a Gentile. Luke wasn't even there in the time of Jesus, which would have been like, who do you think you are? And Luke took every other story of every other person over 20 years. So you have three guys who put maybe 300, 500 hours. Luke put, is a low estimate, 50,000 hours. 40 to 60 to 80 hours a week for 20 years. Carefully researching 500 to 1,000 people. So he was a researcher. So the difference in these three, this book versus these two books is, is, is dramatically different. And the third is he was the third book. So you have 70 AD, Mark's stenography of Peter's book. And again, Peter was a real guttural, emotional guy, just a verbal vomit. Blah, blah, blah. Here's what happened. Write it down, buddy. Write it down. So that comes out. This nice little 16-chapter book. Everybody loves it. Matthew comes along a few years later and says, that's a pretty good book. I have a few stories to add to it. So he has about 25% of his own stories. 80 AD. Meantime, around 70 AD, as Mark's book is coming out, Luke starts to hear this word, panic. And I'm going to give a teaching today that is so fascinating, so directly from the Word of God, but is the most encouraging teaching for people who love to organize. And if you are someone who loves to organize, it is time for you and those around you to recognize why God gave you this gift. And I'm going to give you a very affirming teaching, but I need you to be bold. I need you to be confident. So if you are someone, and sometimes there's two of them in a marriage. That's really a nice marriage, very clean closet usually. If you like to organize, I need you to hold your hand up loud and proud and all the way up in here. Hold it up real high. Way up, way up, way up. See there, that's a clean closet right there. All right, now. For people who like to organize, for those of you who do not understand them, I want you to listen very carefully. The reason why they like to organize is they have a gift. I want you to hear this word. The gift is the gift of foresight. People like to organize because they know that if this mess stays a mess, life will get harder and harder and harder. And their heart's desire is for life to get easier. So you're going to say this word out loud. And those of you who didn't raise your hand will sit in your lap if you don't say this word out loud. So listen to me carefully. This is very important. People who like to organize, like to organize because they have the gift of foresight. foresight. They not that so much they mind the clothes on the floor, although they do mind. And yes, we can be anal. I am saying we, and we can get uptight. But it's more that we see into the future. And we see that life's going to get harder and harder and harder. So, around 90 A.D. is when Luke wrote his gospel. But he researched it starting maybe even earlier than 70 A.D., but 20-plus years. And he was panicking. 
and he expresses his panic in the very first sentence. If you read it, it's right there. He says these words. He says, many. Now, many is a whole lot more than Mark and Matthew. Now, many estimated is probably somewhere between 50 and 100. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of, is it things singular or plural? Things that have been fulfilled among us. So, 72 AD, there's 35 different parchments floating around of eyewitness stories. 78 AD, there's 120 different parchments. There's some are eyewitnesses, some are secondhand. And everybody's got a story. Remember, John said if all the things that were written about Jesus, they would fill the, all the books on the earth. So everybody's got a story. There's 17 different versions of the 5,000 5, being fed and all these different stories. I saw this and I saw this. And everybody's written them down. And, and, and everybody's fine with that because people who are not organized do not have the gift of foresight. foresight. And so people are saying, well, we got Matthew's book and, and Mark's book. And besides, it doesn't really matter, Luke. Calm down. Because after all, Jesus is coming back any day now. He said it'd be soon. <laughs> you got to be careful when God says soon. <laughs> Luke, however, has a gift of organization, and he says, what if soon means a hundred years? And we're handling this so sloppy, and Gary, and Ben, and Jermaine, all these stories. Nobody knows if it's firsthand or secondhand. Nobody's verified. Nobody sat down with them, and there's parchments floating all over the place, and nobody's organized all this. And yeah, it's all good while everybody here has met Jesus, and everybody here talked to Jesus, but what about 100 years from now? What if it's like 500 years till Jesus comes back? And so Luke was really looking forward into the future, and he was seeing, who was he seeing? He was seeing us. And he was panicking. And by the way, there's different contexts of compliment to insult. There's an insult where you put someone down. There's also a correction. There's also a compliment. In between a correction and insult and a compliment, there's a thing, thing called a non-compliment. A non-compliment is something that high C's or organized people give when they don't want to insult you. And you've done a sloppy job and they say, that was a good effort. So if ever you give to a really high perfectionist and you do, they say, that was a good effort. That's called a what? A non-compliment. <laughs> well, if you look at the word undertaken, it's a non-compliment. <laughs> they, they're trying. <laughs> Many have undertaken, have, have doing their best effort to write down all these sloppy stories. <laughs> and he's freaking out and making a mess of everything. It's really loud here. He goes on. Watch it carefully. Just as they were handed down to us. He says, I admit I wasn't there. Who from the first were eyewitnesses. I admit I wasn't one of them. And servants of the word. And then four of the most emotional words in all the Bible. With this in mind. With what in mind? A mess. A freak out panic mess. We got 75 different parchments. We got 15 different versions of every story. With this in mind, I myself, not a witness, not a Jew. And I promise you in the 20 years, I promise you. This is a, this is a sidebar. It's not one of the main points about organized people. But I promise you a hundred times he tried to pass off this job to a Jew who had been there. And they all turned him down. Because don't you know he was ridiculed. He was put down. He was insulted. Who do you think you are? You non-Jew, non-witness writing a gospel. So I wanted, I, a lot of times us organized people, we organize it because no one else will do it. Can I get an amen? amen? End of pity party right there. I just wanted to say that one thing. <laughs> get it out. Move on. But that's what he was. He was forced into this. And so he said, I myself, no one else would do it. No one else saw the panic. Have three words. First word, Carefully. Second word is what? Investigate. And that third word is a big word. I tracked down every single Benjamin, every single Germain, every single Charlie. I tracked them all down. 
He said, from the beginning. He spent, now, his time with Mary is really significant. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. And I, too, decided to write what kind of an account? I, just too, decided to write an orderly account. Now, why is that important? Matthew, Mark, and John are not chronological. I don't know if you know that. The only chronological one is Luke. Matthew, Mark, and John are also not historical. There's no points of historical account. Only Luke says, this is during the time of Herod, this is during the time of this priest. He says, the people in the future are going to want to know when this happened and tie it to history. And he said, why did I do all of this? I did it for those who are high excellence lovers of God. And I need you now to be a high excellence lover of God. I need you to grab your pen, grab your sermon handout. I need you to write something down. The theme of this book and maybe the most important thing I will ever teach in my life is this one thing. The more I walk in excellence in my walk with Jesus, the more I protect my, write down the word, love of God. And hear me, if, if there's one thing, the next, if you hear nothing I say in all my life, hear what I say for the next two minutes. What I have discovered in 41 years of pastoring is that crisis produces little change. And that may shock you. But I have seen thousands, tens of thousands of crises. Ah, my wife is divorcing me. Ah, my child's threatening suicide. Ah, drugs is killing me. Ah, I'm losing my house. And I've seen that crisis produces emotional freakouts, but as soon as the pressure of the crisis is over, people tend to return to their static state of chasing pleasure. And change is the only way, listen, these things that are killing us, our anger, our pettiness, our selfishness, our impatience, our meanness, our judgment, they're, they're, they would destroy our lives, and we've we got to change. But people think that change is hard. Now listen very carefully. Look me in the eye. I'm about, to, I'm about to unlock the secrets of all life for you. In every other case, change is hard. In every other case, change is miserable and pain and crisis. But there is one secret, one way, where change is sweet, consistent, Easy and even unintentional. There is a power, the greatest power in the universe. And there's a secret that only kingdom of God people, the, the, the real kingdom of God people, the best of the kingdom of God people know that is this. The whole theme of the book of Luke. Those who daily, as the highest precious privilege of their life, daily digest the word of God with someone else. The word of God was not written for us. It was written to flow through us. We'll call making disciples. That every day of their life, they say, the most, listen, the word of God for me is not weak old leftover broccoli that I have to take a bite of. The word of God is gold and silver. And if the most best attention, the best time of my life is to digest the word of God, to find something of life, and to share it with someone else, and they share it with me. What happens is the word, the, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. That word has living power. And if I will take most excellent Theophilus, highest excellence lover of God, and I will make that the most, if it's 10 minutes a day, if it's the most precious thing of my life, daily digest the word of God with someone else, what happens is over a period of years inside me, and this is the most powerful adjective of all, unintentionally, I will change. I'll find myself being understanding before I get angry. I found myself being patient before I'm impatient. I found myself smiling instead of being grumpy. I found myself being kind instead of selfish. I found myself listening before I want to talk. I found myself being edifying and believing the best about people rather than judging people. And I never even intended to adopt those attitudes. I didn't strive and say I should be more patient. I just digested. And that word was so alive that those things happened when I didn't even look for them. Does that give you chills? That's not the air conditioning. That's the power of God. And the whole book of Luke, he said, don't be sloppy about this. If you will take the word of God and take it with such treasured excellence, he said, your love. And he goes on and says this the second time. Watch this. He said, I wrote an orderly account so that. Somebody say, so that. And here's one of the greatest promises. You may know. The word know, gnosko means no. Epigonosko means like Superman know. 
It's super intensive, no. The certainty, a certainty means never doubt. So you may epigonosco the certainty as failure of the things you've been taught. He says, you take the word of God and daily digest it, and you will never, ever even waver. The strength of God will grow in your life every year of your life. So that's the theme. And as a result of this theme, there's 39 things that he wound up with. Five teachings, 16 stories, and 18 parables. And here's the thing. I would imagine he started with about 500. And the work he put in, I mean, Matthew, Mark, John, 300 hours. Luke, 50,000 hours over 20 plus years. Thousands of interviews. And 500 stories trimmed down. Many of them just corroborating of other stories. And there's 39 things that are only in the Gospel of Luke. Now, let me say one more thing because I'm just going to list these for you today. Then we're going to pray. But there's one other thing I want to teach you about people who have a gift of organizing. First thing I want to teach you, and never forget this, is people, have, people organize because they have the gift of foresight. Don't ever forget that. They, it's not that they're freaking out over the mess. They just know life's going to get harder. If you'll take a minute right then and there and order things, life will get easier. The second one is this. Now, organizing people often don't know this because it is true that people who have the gift of organizing can begin to worship that gift and they become Marthas. Where they're, they're more focused on organizing because the real purpose, in Scripture they're called eagles. And eagles mount up with wings like eagles. The purpose of an organizational gift is to create calmness so that we can then wait on the Holy Spirit. You see, every sermon I've done for the last 30 years, I completely finished that sermon. I mean sermon handout, PowerPoint, stood up and practiced it out loud a minimum of a month before I did it. Put it in a can, finished it. Finished. That's hard work. A lot of hard work. I can't tell you how many times that was a lot, a lot of work. And then what I do is two to three weeks, before, and I just sit there, let it sit there. And then I pull out two to three weeks before, and I just, I just have germinate on it. And sometimes the Lord changes 5%, sometimes he changes, a lot of times he's changed the whole sermon. But I had to get completely calm, and then I just soak it in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask every one of you at the end of this sermon to take these questions. We are five weeks ahead in these sermons. And every one of my teachers already has their question. You know how much hard work my team is putting in? We will always have four to five to six really good questions so that you can end the sermon. Here's next week's questions like I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you to answer those questions within 24 to 48 hours. I'm going to ask you to say, okay, when I get these questions on Sunday morning, I'm not going to pick one thing. I'm not going to eat ice cream. Or I'm not going to watch TV. Or I'm not going to do Facebook. Or I'm not going to go for a walk. Or I'm not going to play basketball until I answer these questions. Something maybe by Monday night because this is not leftover broccoli. This is gold. And the reason I want you to do that is if you answer by Monday night and then get a teammate and share, then you'll let them sit there. And you'll think that oh, that's the best I can do. And then all of a sudden, Wednesday and Thursday, you'll go, oh, I hadn't thought about this. The job of organized people, see, you, you th if you're not organized, listen to me. You think you can hear from the Holy Spirit, but you, you cannot hear from the Holy Spirit when there is bees of busyness of things you have to do buzzing outside your head. And the organized person's job is to bring everything home. So watch this. John, the apostle John, he never intended to write a gospel. Wasn't planned on it. Luke did such a magnificent job finishing everything. John's just the kid. And, and some say 10 years later. It actually could have been 10, 15, 20 years later. And Luke just brought calmness to the whole body of Christ. All these crazy stories. He, he researched them all. The whole, everybody knew it. John took all, uh, Luke took all this disorder and brought calmness, excellence, peace. And after Luke's gospel, we went, oh, man, perfect. And old John just sat back and said, man, Luke just killed it. Oh, man, it's just great. And 5, 10, 15 years later, the Spirit of God just began to soak on. Is that everything, John? Yeah, Lord, Luke just knocked it out. Are you sure, John? You know, there were some private conversations between you and Jesus that no one else knows about. And because there was calm, these deep revelations that only John knew about God, we would never would have got the gospel of John if Luke hadn't brought us to a place of calm. So here's what Luke gave us that we never would have had. Five, story, five teachings of Jesus about greed, about suffering not linked to guilt, place of honor at the table, the cost of following Jesus, and the purse and the sword. Sixteen stories. 
the entire infancy narrative of John the Baptist being born. Jesus presented the temple, 12 years old in the temple. The miraculous draft of fish. Now watch 3, 4, and 5 and tell me the theme you see. The dead widow's son, the woman who bathes Jesus' feet, the woman who accompanied Jesus. What's the theme you see there? Women. We are a multicultural church. And one of the things I'm very proud of is as a Caucasian, I'm very loud about the fact that Caucasians need to be humble. And by leading the way in humility, I say there's some strengths that the Caucasian race brings, but there's a lot of flaws. And we humble ourselves because no race has all the heart of Jesus. And every race brings some of the heart of Jesus and a lot of flesh. And so the whole thing is we all want to be more like Jesus. And every race has some special, unique parts of Jesus and some flesh. So when I point out the, you, the flesh areas of a race, I'm not being unkind. I'm simply saying we all want to be more like Jesus. So when I point out that the Jewish culture in that day was very denigrating and very harsh and very put down of women, I'm not trying to be unkind. They had some godly traits, but they were basically cruel towards women. Women were not allowed to read the Torah. Women were not allowed to touch the Torah. Women were not allowed to speak in a man's presence if it was not, his husband, not, not a family member. They weren't allowed to talk. They were very, very, but Gentiles treated women with much more respect and graciousness and valued women. So here's three Gospels written by Jews. And God forced this one Gentile who for 20 years kept saying, you sure Jew doesn't want to write this? And they all turned him down because God wanted one one by Gentiles. There are more stories about women in the Gospel of Luke than Matthew, Mark, and John combined. And when you read, this is really interesting, when you read The only other infancy story is in Matthew. And when you read Matthew, you go, okay, well, why does Matthew have the the story of Herod killing the babies and Joseph having a dream here and Joseph having a dream there and them escaping into Egypt? It's very obvious. And Matthew's story was first. Matthew was a Jew. He walked into the room and said, I'm collecting information. Mary, answer some questions for me. What did God say to your husband? What else did God say to your husband? What else did God say to your husband? Where did your husband do next? Anything else God said to your husband? Okay, good. Walked out. And that's exactly what happened. Ten years later, Luke came and said, honored woman, tell me everything. What was going on? And he sat there for a year or two and all these stories they wouldn't have gotten. And so Luke has all this rich insight about women. I mean, look at number uh, uh, six and seven, sending the 72. Mary and Martha. We would never have Mary and Martha story if not for Luke. Martha, Martha, you're worried about many things, but only one thing is necessary. The healing of the crippled woman on the Sabbath. We wouldn't have that one if it wasn't for Luke. The man with dropsy, the cleansing of the ten lepers and the Samaritan leper. We wouldn't have that one except for uh, Luke. The good old Zacchaeus, scrawny little Zacchaeus up in the tree. We wouldn't have him. Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, Jesus before Herod, the meeting with the daughters of Jerusalem when he falls on the way to the cross and they're weeping for, don't weep for me, weep for yourself. The good and the bad thieves, today you'll be with me in paradise. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus, do you know how much research that took? And above all, the 18 parables took more research because the parable, he had to to confirm it like five and ten times to get the story right. Parable of two men owed money, one small, one great. They're both for forgiven. Who would love more? And the answer is, he's been forgiven much, loves much. And forever, we said, he's been, listen, I've been forgiven much. Anybody here been forgiven much? <laughs> and we love much. We wouldn't have that if it wasn't for Luke. Working like a dog for 20 years, not paid. Despised and ridiculed. But he was looking ahead and he saw us. He saw us. Don't pick on organizing people. Be nice to them. The good Samaritan, maybe the second greatest parable ever. The friend at night being persistent. The rich fool, I got so much money, I got more money, I think I'll save it all. God said, you're going to die tonight, you fool. That's where the phrase, you fool, came from, from Jesus. You know that? You fool, that's from Jesus. The watching servants where the master waits on them. Punishment with many blows, punishment with few blows. That's a fascinating thing. That you're punished according to how much you know you're disobeying the Lord. The barren tree that's given another chance to bear fruit. The wedding feast. Take the lowest place. Counting the cost. The tower and the war. The woman who loses a coin. The prodigal son. The only place in the Bible where God runs. 
The father looked, watching every day. And when you were running from God, he was looking every day. And when he saw his son coming back, it says, God ran. There's a song, you've heard that, when God, we wouldn't have that story if Luke hadn't done all that work, confirmed it over and over again. Yes, that's what Jesus said. The wasteful steward, God, Jesus said, use money to get friends for eternity. The rich man and Lazarus, one in Abraham's bosom, one in hell. Uh, what a worthy and unworthy servant is. Number 16, where there's a dead body there, the vultures will gather. I have no idea what that parable means, and neither does anyone else. Maybe that's when it'll be figured out by the end of time. The unjust judge and the pleading widow. The Pharisee and the tax collector where the Pharisee is so righteous. And the tax collector said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus, that's the one that's going to go away righteous. So there's this theme here that when you digest the word, it produces this knowing, this strength, this, this unintentional life that changes you. So here's what we're going to do. Take your pens and papers. This is the best Bible study you're ever going to do in your life because of these questions. Here's our Bible study questions for next week. And these are great questions. Next week we are covering 51 verses. Now I'm going to ask you a question. The answer to the question is rarely. What's the answer? Rarely. Question is, how often in the Bible do angels identify themselves by name? Rarely. rarely. So if you have two stories back to back where we're told the name of the angel, and in fact it's a big name, wouldn't you think that maybe... A digester of the word of God would say, hmm, maybe I'm supposed to compare the story of Zechariah and Mary. That's what a student of the word might dig in and find out. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to study both Zechariah and Mary's story back to back. And here's the first question. Both Zechariah and Mary, I'm going to give you little tips on all these. That's the advantage of actually paying attention. <laughs> both Zechariah and Mary asked the angel Gabriel for assurance and clarity. So Gabriel comes to both of them and says, I have a great blessing for you, a great promise. And both of them say, can I have a little assurance and clarity? Zechariah gets rebuked. Mary gets praised. Why? That's an easy one. I'll tell you which ones are easy, which ones are hard. That's an easy one. You shouldn't have to read it but two or three times, and you'll get the answer to that one pretty easily. Number two, does Zechariah's wrong reaction have anything to do with his age? I will tell you that's not a clear answer one. That's the one where we're just sort of guessing. So your guess and my guess. There's not a, the first one has a very definitive answer. The second one does not have a definitive answer. It's just a guess. So you might, my, my answer and your answer might be different, but we both, both might be right. Number three is a very definitive answer, and it's a very easy answer, but it's also an answer that has five and six layers of answers. What is merciful about Zechariah's punishment? It's a fascinating, fairly easy, but fascinating. Number four is either going to be the easiest question or the hardest question, depending how weird you are. So let me help you with number four. On her way to visit Elizabeth, Mary had two questions pounding in her head. Remember, she immediately went and visited her cousin. Both questions were answered as soon as she walked into the home of Elizabeth. What were the two questions pounding in Mary's head every second on a long trip to Elizabeth's home? Let me, let me help you with this here, okay? When I ask you questions, when you study the word of God, the key thing is don't be weird. Don't be spiritual. Be normal. Don't sit there and think, I don't know. Let me, I bet she was thinking, I'm the mother of the Messiah. She wasn't thinking that. She was a barefoot girl who only got food maybe five out of seven days from the dirt poor country, uh, the least of the least of the least. She's probably 13 years old. And now she's left home and she's traveling with a caravan 90 miles, traveling with a bunch of strange men and one female chaperone. And she's, she's sleeping on cold ground overnight, probably can't even afford a blanket. And she's, she's about to go meet her 62-year-old cousin she's only seen maybe two times in her life. And she's just supposedly just met this angel and each day it gets a little more confusing. And, she, and she's, she's thinking these two questions. And if you're at all normal, the questions are automatic. So don't get weird. Just be normal. Just become the person in the Bible with all the normal frailty and, and flaws and, and, and weaknesses and tenderness of an average person. And you'll quickly see then why God does next what he does for that person. So here's our two closing prayers. Prayer number one is, Lord, thank you for all this, protecting my love, because I recognize the privilege and opportunity of this study, and I choose to be diligent and give my heart to learn your heart. So what you're saying here is, 
I am not, I recognize that, that my team of teachers led by my pastor, I'm, gonna do about, I'm doing two teachings, Pastor Helen's doing one, then I'm doing two, and I'm going to do you know, half or more than half. But all of my teachers are always going to ha- end the sermon with next week's sermon teachings. And we're always going to answer them the next week. And we're going we're to provide to you gold and apples of gold and settles, settings of silver. And I, you're saying, I'm not going to treat this like weak old broccoli. Weak old broccoli stinks. Have I mean, you ever had it? It stinks. You throw it away. Phew. I'm going to treat this like gold and silver. And I'm going to take this and within... My Monday night at the ladies, preferably by Sunday, I'm going to just, I'm going to go home and tackle these things. And I'm going to have fun with this. And I'm going to create some sort of self-accountability. No ice cream or no TV or, or no sports or something like that. No Facebook until I get these things done. And the second one is I'm going to find me a teammate. Now, I will just say something out loud. Say, I am cute. And I am charming. And you cannot say no to me. Y'all didn't do very good. Let's try that again. Say, I am cute. And I am charming. And you cannot say no to me. So you just find your mate or a friend or one of your kids, and you say, look, I'm gonna, it's going to be so much easier for me if by, like, Monday night I know someone's mailing me their answers, and I'm going to email you my answers. And that way, if you email your answers and, and I email you mine, we're, like, twice as likely to get the right answer. We're going to feel so smart when, when the sermon comes, and, and, and I'll have so much more fun, and it'll be easier for me and easier for you. So I'm not really asking. You're going to be my partner. So you just explain to them, I am cute and I am charming and you're going to be my partner. So that's prayer number two. You just go to someone and make it clear that they need a partner and you are very blessed that you have chosen them. They are blessed. You've cho- All right, close your eyes, please. Prayer number one, this is not weak old broccoli, Lord. This is a whole book that says that I could spend my whole life in crisis and reaction and change can always be miserable. And I could feel like a failure all the time and I have wrong attitudes and I'm always failing and climbing three steps up and four steps back. And I don't want to be a failure. And Lord, I want, I want change to be sweet and gentle and consistent and unintentional. But to do that, the word of God has got to be the most precious thing in my life. So I want this to be excellence that I daily digest it with someone else. And I will start right here. It's going to be fun. I want to make it fun and precious. And I'm committing, Lord, to treasure this opportunity and to study richly and to put some accountability in my life that I will do this right off the bat first thing so I can soak in your presence. If you're committing to treasure this opportunity, hold your hand up real high right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This is going to be a sweet time to put your hands back down. Second prayer is, I am cute and I am charming, and I'm, gonna, I'm not really asking. Now, you're blessed. I'm going I'm to chase somebody down for a partner. If you're determined to get you a good partner, hold your hand back up. That's going to make it so much more fun. Now, put your hands back down. Lord, we come to you now, and we're really in awe, Lord, of what Luke did. Really in awe. Lord, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dismissing what Peter and Mark did together and what Matthew did and what John did, but theirs, wasn't, theirs was Kennesaw Mountain. Lord, Luke climbed Mount Everest. I think he climbed it in bare feet. And he did it for us, Lord. Lord, let us honor the price he paid that we would always treasure the word of God and let the word of God be power flowing through us. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said. Do me one more favor and turn to the person next to you and tell them you really are cute and charming. They wanted to hear it.